Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Database Talks are made possible by Ottertune. Learn how to automatically optimise your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottertune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. All right, guys. Uh, welcome. It's a new semester. Welcome to the Vaccination Database Seminar Series here held at Carnegie Mellon. So we have a whole semester of, of awesome database speakers lined up to tell you about the, the various systems that they're building. And one of the things we're trying to do this semester is also have a sprinkling of some of the top researchers in academia come talk about the systems that they've been working on as well. With that, we are very excited today as, as the first speaker for the seminar series to have Dan Abadi. Dan doesn't need an introduction, uh, but he, I mean, he's one of the leading researchers in databases uh, in academia right now. He should have come to Carnegie Mellon, but he went to University of Maryland. That's okay. Uh, he's won the Jim Gray Award. Uh, you've won Sloan and a bunch of other great things. He is, again, he is one of the premier experts of databases. So with that, Dan, the floor is, is yours. Ah, I'd like to say, again, we want to do what we did last semester. If you have, any, if you have a question for Dan, please unmute yourself, uh, say who you are, where you're coming from, uh, and then ask Dan your question. We want this to be interactive, uh, so please you know, you know, engage as much as possible. All right, Dan, go for it. The floor is yours. Yeah, I just want to just want to uh, reiterate what Andy said. Um, yeah, definitely feel free to interrupt. I'm very happy to uh, uh, interact with uh, with people as as we go. Um, and I just uh, how long do we have, Andy? I forgot what the time the time constraints are. Uh, you have an hour. Now, okay, all right. So uh, we'll see how far we can get. Uh, these slides can probably last for a little bit longer than that, but we'll we'll, we'll stop when 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 uh, Andy tells us to stop. Go for it. Yes. Uh, okay. So. Um, I also want to uh, sort of take the opportunity before I start to sort of um, sort of publicly uh, thank Andy Pollock. So uh, that's that's the the beginning. Now let's jump into Slog. So um, Slog is a system; it's a distributed system uh, that is really sort of designed to process transactions at scale across the world. So uh, so if you have an application which is a, a truly worldwide application where you have users all over the world. The document with data. Uh, how you know what is the right way? Um, uh, well, first of all, what are some problems they run into, and how do you solve those problems uh, in uh, in building a, a distributed data store uh, that is uh, that has certain high levels of guarantees? Specifically, you want to sort of guarantee things like strict sizeability, where uh, you know we have sort of very high levels of isolation and consistency in, in the system. And that's the goal with Slog, um, and so we'll we'll talk about sort of what the challenges are and how do we solve or at least. Uh, Make uh, make progress towards solving those challenges. So that's that's the goal here. Uh, so uh, before we get to that, I mean, let me see if I can actually progress the slides here. Okay, good. Um, so before we get to that, um, so just sort of remind ourselves how databases work. Um, when they're running on a single node, which is the easy case, and we kind of figured this out about 30 years ago. Um, you know, and uh, you know, again, if you want to you know find out about how concurrency control works, you should take, you should uh, look at Andy's lectures on. MVCC versus OCC versus locking, right? So uh, all these things, you know, it's, it's been known for, for decades now, uh, but let's just review quickly how they work. Um, so let's say we have a database running on a single node, single machine um, in a single location, and we are gonna be a retail company. Uh, this is a retail application that we're storing data in a database. Um, and so our entire application as shown on this slide is two tables. Um, you know, obviously it'd be more in, in reality, it'd be more tables than that, but just to make this in a slide is two tables. Uh, a, a list, a widget table, which are the, 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 thing, the things we're trying to sell, and a customer table, which are the people trying to buy those widgets. And we're going to assume that people buy widgets with store credit in, in our application here, right? So, uh, so we have a widget table, we have a customer table, and now a transaction comes along, say, um, uh, say, uh, you know, a customer two wants to, let me, sorry, I have to get rid of my, uh, get rid of this pop up over here. Uh, so, uh, so customer two comes along and wants to buy widget three with store credit. Okay, so, wh so what would the transaction code look like? It would look like something along the lines of shown on the right here, uh, where, uh, uh, where we have to uh, read uh, the widgets table to, to figure out, you know, do we have enough of widget three left in, 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 uh, in stock? Uh, we have to read customer two to see does customer two have enough store credit to be able to buy this particular widget. And if both of those things are true, uh, then we can proceed with a transaction which involves so subtracting one from the inventory because we're selling this, this widget now and subtracting the amount of the price of the widget from the store credit of the customer. 
right? So, you know, this can be, you know, initially written potentially in SQL and converted to this or written directly in some kind of store procedure language. Uh, but, uh, but either way, we have some code which, which runs this transaction against our database system. So the way you would do this, if you let's say you we, let's say we're going to use a locking based concurrency control, right? So the way this works is that you would lock the relevant record. So uh, rigid three is relevant. You're going to have to read it and, and update it eventually. Uh, customer two is relevant, so we'll have to also uh, read it and update it. Uh, so we'll lock those two records in our database system, and then uh, we'll go ahead and and you know and run all this code, sort of process this code, uh, changing the uh, you know checking, doing all the check all these statements to see if we if we actually able to run the transaction, and if so, uh, then making all the changes. We'll do all that while holding the locks. So you see that uh, the store code has now been updated to down to twenty one, and the uh, the stock has been updated down to zero. And once we're done with those updates, we can release the locks. Um, and that is sort of a pretty straightforward way to, uh, to guarantee serializability, uh, serializable isolation in, in a database system. So, uh, uh, so that's, that, that's where it would work. You know, I mean, there's other ways to do this, there's other control protocols to do this, but you know, this is sort of a, a pretty common way to process transactions in a single node database system. So what's the challenge? Or when we go from a single node to a multi-node and then eventually to a geographically replicated database system, you know, what are the challenges that show up? So the first um, um, is uh, that, you know, just the process of, of scaling an application usually means we're going to partition our data across multiple machines. So rather than having all the data be on a, being on a single machine, instead, now we may take our customer table, which had eight customers and dividing it off across four machines, say in this example, of course, in practice, we much many more than that, but uh, again, one slide here, we'll just make it four machines. So we'll just send it, you know, two customers to each machine. And we have, uh, say, um, uh, a, uh, um, you know, we, we had uh, four widgets in our original database. So we'll divide that across the four machines as well, just one widget per machine, right? So now we just, we just partitioned our data across four different machines. And for now, we're just having the same location. Eventually, we'll make it distributed across the world. But for now, it's just in one location. But still, there's a challenge here, right? Because, you know, the basic problem that can happen is, uh, uh, is that once on different machines, you have sort of failures happening independently from each other, right? So one machine can fail, another one being, uh, can, cannot fail. And so you have sort of uh, a potential to, uh, to have new types of, of violations of atomicity that you wouldn't really see so much in a, uh, in a single load database system. So let's, let's see this in more detail. So let's, let's get rid of um, the, the partitions which are not relevant to our example here. Um, so we'll just leave two of them on the screen here, which, which has uh, customer two and widget three, uh, since, our since our example was customer uh, two buying widget three. Okay, so here are two partitions on two different machines. We have the same exact transaction we had before, but now we're going to sort of run this code across these two machines, right? So each machine will run the part of the code that is relevant for, um, uh, for that machine. So for example, um, uh, this machine on the top right of the screen over here, which has a customer two, this will do the, the eventually will do the update of the customer store credit. Uh, and the machine on the, on the lower left here, which has the information about the widget will eventually change the stock from one to zero. But in order to run the transaction, there has to be some communication between the machines, both during and after the transaction. So during the transaction, we have this line of code in our transaction, which says if the store credit is less than the price, right? So this is a, um, you know, this is sort of a check we have to do to make sure the customer has enough credit to be able to buy the widget. Uh, so this if statement cannot be done by each, by in each machine or any machine individually. Uh, this requires information about store credit, information about price, and that information is stored separately on different machines. Uh, so, um, uh, so there has to be some communication to be able to check this line of code to see if the credit is less than the price, right? So let's, let's assume that we, that we will do this, is that we'll, uh, we, we'll still use locking for in our example. So we'll lock the relevant customer or we'll lock the relevant widget. Um, uh, and then what we'll do is we'll send a message from one machine, the machine that has the widget information, the price information, and send it to the other machine, uh, which has the customer information, so that that way the customer machine has enough information to run the SIF statement uh, by uh, to, to check to see if the customer has, an, has enough credit to be able to buy the widget. So assuming that uh, that pass, uh, that, that that check uh, proceeds, um, that it just doesn't fail, uh, then the transaction can, can, can continue. And each machine will go ahead and do the, the relevant, uh, uh, its relevant part of the transaction. So the top right machine will update the store credit down to 21 and the bottom left machine will update the stock back, back down to zero uh, where, where it was one before, right? The last two lines of, of the code of this transaction. 
So, uh, so that'll happen independently. Uh, but then the problem is, is that there has to be some protocol that checks to make sure that each machine was able to do what it was supposed to do, right? So for example, the bar left machine doesn't yet know whether the top right machine actually did, you know, was able to, you know, there was enough uh, credit for uh, the, the store credit of customer two was higher than the price. It doesn't know that yet. So there has to be some protocol where the machines check with each other to make sure that uh, um, uh, the, each machine was, was uh, independently able to do their part of the transaction. And that's typically done via some uh, commit protocol, a commit time, of, you know, the most common commit protocol is two-phase commit, right? So that's sort of like a, four, uh, you know, sort of two rounds of communication back and forth between the machines, uh, prepare the, you know, the, the, the voting stage, and then, um, you know, sort of acknowledge uh, a, a declaration of the final decision, and then an acknowledgement state, stage uh, between uh, between the two, all the machines involved in the transaction to run, uh, to run this commit protocol. So, uh, <clears throat> Uh, so, uh, so that's, uh, so that's happening, but the, the key thing with, uh, with, with these commit protocols is that you can't release your locks, uh, sort of before you run the protocol, because, uh, because it could be that the protocol comes out, they're going to have to abort the transaction. If you bought the transaction, you want to make sure that nobody else will see aborted data. So we end up having to keep locks, uh, throughout the commit protocol. Uh, and that's what that's going to cause is it's going to prevent conflicting transactions to run during the commit protocol, which overall sort of reduces the throughput of, of our system, right? So if we have a workload of our, against our system where we're, we're frequently running transactions which conflict with each other, which are accessing the same data, reads or writing the same data, you know, that's a conflicting workload. And having all this communication back and forth between the machines, both during the transaction processing and after that transaction processing to run a commit protocol, since, they, since each machine can fail independently, um, that is gonna add to the, the amount of time that we're holding locks much more so than if you're running on a single machine. So one basic problem you run into when you're running in a distributed database system uh, is that you end up sort of sending messages which take time while holding locks, and that ends up sort of reducing our ability to, to, to run conflicting transactions in the workload. So that's one problem. That's, and that's, that problem exists just even within one, one sort of physical location, right? Even within one data center, it still takes some time to send messages and back and forth, and that time certainly, um, uh, you, know, uh, you know, that time we're holding locks. Now, of course, if, if the machines are further apart from each other across different locations, it's even worse. Right? We're sending machines, we're sending messages across, uh, you know, across continents that that'll take much longer. We'll hold the locks for even longer. It'll be even even, you know, even worse. So that's one problem: is commit protocol. The other problem is replication, right? So in general, we're going to replicate data. If we're running a, a truly global application, we're going to replicate data across the world because we want our reads to be fast. We want to have our users locate any location in the world to be able to to read uh, the uh, read data as part of the application very quickly. So they shouldn't have to send a message all the way across the world to find out the state of the application. Rather, they should be able to see the state of the application from a local read. So this is typically done via replication. We'll replicate data across the world um, to, to be near our, our users of our application. So uh, there's two types of replication. There's asynchronous replication and synchronous replication. Um, so, uh, so typically speaking, if you want to have a consistent uh, view of the data, no matter where our users are, they all see the same database, uh, then uh, the replication is typically done synchronously. Uh, and, uh, and we'll see later on uh, that you know, it can be done asynchronously as well, but, uh, but it's much harder to do asynchronously. And, and typically done, it, it, it's typically it's, it's synchronous to, uh, to, to ensure consistency. So, uh, so, so what that means then is that uh, we, we run a, uh, in, in a traditional AV system, the, we, we, the, the way we, we typically make replication work is that you run the uh, a, a transaction gets sorry a transaction gets submitted to the system uh, gets submitted to some one of the locations right it's a right transaction changes the state of a database so it gets submitted to one of the replicas and that replica will go ahead and process that transaction locally right so here we'll have the same uh, We'll have the same uh, transaction we had before, where the customer two was buying widget three, and so we updated the token to twenty one, and the, the stock down to zero as part of that same transaction. Right, so it gets processed in one location first, and then after it's done processing, and after even we run the commit protocol, um, typically, although there are you know optimizations you can make there, but uh, typically after running the commit protocol. Um, uh, we then replicate the data synchronously to start to all the other locations, or at least the majority of uh, at least the majority of replication replicas that we have across the world, uh, to uh, to uh, uh, before we commit the transaction, right? So we so we'll take our, our change we made in one location, 
replicated it into to other locations, uh, and then they'll acknowledge back that they made those changes, um, or at least they received the, uh, the, the, the set of changes. Um, and that whole time also we're holding locks. We cannot release the locks on the original location that where we first ran the transaction until we received the act back because we're running synchronous, synchronous replication. If we were to release the locks early before we get the act back, it's number one, it's possible that the, the other location never received the message. And number two, even if they did, um, now um, you know, we may have some, you know, we, you may run into consistency issues if you're not holding locks while, uh, while you're doing replication. Uh, so, uh, so for all these reasons, we hold locks during application, during synchronous application. And that's again, extending the period of time when we're preventing con conflicting transactions from running. Uh, so basically we have two problems. We have sort of the, the, the sort of the, the latency of the commit protocol, which causes a reduction in throughput because no conflicting transactions can run. And at the same time, we also have, once you have a truly global application, and if you're doing a uh, synchronous application for consistency, then you, you also having holding locks during replication. So you have the latency of the, of, the rep, of the replication protocol, plus the reduction of throughput as a result of holding locks during the, that synchronous application. So for all, all these things, it causes some sort of major latency and throughput problems in, um, in a traditional database system. If, if you care about consistency, if you care about isolation in, in the database. So, uh, you know, so one solution is just forget about it, just, you know, forget consistency, forget isolation, and, you know, do no SQL and all those, you know, options that are out there that sort of, you know, doesn't make these, these strong guarantees. Uh, but what if you do want to guarantee, what if you do want to have the same guarantees we're all used to in, in a traditional system, right? So what, how would you sort of, uh, how can we fix these problems, uh, uh, these throughput, these latency problems, that which are caused by, uh, by the, na the distributed nature of the application? So, uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so, the answers are going to basically be determinism. Determinism is going to allow us to solve a lot of these problems, uh, and it's going to happen in stages. Going to, there'll be some things that come very naturally, and some things which require a little bit more thought to, to allow determinism to help us. But, but we'll see that determinism is going to sort of allow us to really um, allow us to make the same guarantees as, as a traditional system, yet uh, remove a lot of these, these problems that we mentioned in the previous slides. So let, let's see how this works. So let's do replication first, because replication is much easier. To, it's much more natural to understand how determinism helps with replication, and it's sort of um, it's just a little bit more straightforward to discuss. Um, so let's do that first, and then we'll get to uh, the whole um, commit protocol and uh, and and, uh, uh, <clears throat> um, and the throughput reductions from there afterwards. So let's do replication first, right? So in in a deterministic system, uh, the definition of determinism is that uh, if if two separate copies of the system sees the same input, then uh, the final, they, 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 they were able to process that same input independently from each other. And because of the deterministic, they're guaranteed to result in the same output, right? So uh, the same final state at the end of it, right? So even though they don't communicate with each other, as long as they see the same input, they will end up in the same final state. So that's, you know, that's the deterministic guarantee. Uh, and we'll see soon that, that that's uh, not a guarantee that, that is done by traditional systems. But if you were to have this guarantee, Replication is very straightforward, right? So the way it would work is you simply replicate the input. Uh, so every system will see the same input transaction. And as long as they see the same input, then through determinism, they'll, they'll end up in the same final state, right? So they'll, they'll both sort of see the same input. They'll both independently do what they, what they would do uh, if, if they were a single location system. They would acquire their appropriate locks, make the appropriate changes, um, and then release the locks. And they'll end up in the same final state because of the fact that, that there's a deterministic guarantee, right? So, uh, so if we have determinism, replication is, is very straightforward. And you saw there was no coordination during transaction processing, uh, right? So whereas before we saw that we were holding locks during replication, whereas here in, in our example, in, in, in the deterministic example we saw on this slide, uh, we did the replication before the transaction ran, right? We replicated the input before we even started processing the transaction. So therefore, once we started acquiring locks and running the transaction, there was no communication across the different locations of the world, right? So the US wasn't communicating with Europe, wasn't communicating with Asia uh, in the middle of transaction processing. Um, so, uh, so that sort of you know, completely solves one of the major problems we saw before that we were holding locks uh, during, uh, during the synchronous application. Right, so we're still doing synchronous replication here, right? This is happening now at, at the at the input level, uh, so it's still synchronous replication, but that's happening before the transaction begins, and therefore outside of holding locks. 
and this is, by the way, this is true also if you if weren't using locking, if you're using OCC or using MVCC or other types of currency control protocols, everything I'm saying about locking is true for the protocols as well. Right? So there's sort of, we have this notion of a contention footprint. Uh, you want to sort of not, uh, you want to sort of um, uh, have the application happen outside of the contention footprint. So no matter, so, so, so you should, uh, you know, hopefully you'll take my word for it, but if not, we can, we can talk more offline that everything I'm saying is, is true, not only for locking, but also other concurrency control protocols as well. So Dan, I, I don't want to derail you, but like, I think it's worth saying a little bit that it's like, you're assuming store procedures here, but it, this still works if, you're, if you don't have store procedures. I don't, I don't know if you're talking about that later. Um, so yeah, so I, these examples are all showing store procedures. Um, so, uh, so determinism by itself certainly works without store procedures. There is some complications that, 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 that arise. Well, I guess, yeah, well, well, I think there's some aside on this later on if I, okay. uh, if we get to it. Um, so, uh, so yeah, let's come back to it. I, I think, I think at this point, I, 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 yeah, I, I don't want to steal your thunder. Keep going. Okay. Sounds good. So, um, so yeah, so we'll just try to remember to, to bring that up again, um, in, in probably around 15 to 20 slides. Okay. So, um, Anyway, so there's no quality computer transaction processing, and that's good. Um, and by the way, there's also a side benefit as well, which is not the main benefit, but it's just worth noting, which is that there's less stuff being replicated, right? So um, if when you're when you're replicating a say a uh, you know sort of the MySQL bin log or an Aries log in other systems or um, sort of you know a database system, when, when they when they, when they do replication, they typically send the log of changes. And the log of changes is usually pretty big because every single change you make is uh, it has to be recorded in the log. Um, and often it's you know if it's a physical log, it has a you know a bunch of details about about those changes. Uh, whereas uh, here we're replicating the program rather than the actual state of the uh, state of the changes of the program, right? So typically speaking, code is smaller than changes that the code makes. Uh, so therefore, more often than not, not only do we get the benefit of having sort of less. Uh, no coordination during transaction processing across replicas across the world, but also sending us data across the world as well, which also has some nice benefits as well. Okay, so that's um, uh, so that's sort of nice if we have determinism, but I, I, we should mention sort of why this is not possible in a traditional system, right? So, uh, or why this doesn't happen for free. I mean, it's possible, of course, but it doesn't happen for free in a traditional system. So, uh, so the reason is, is that, uh, the typical guarantee that a database will give you if you're running, if you if you buy a database off the shelf and, and it says it guarantees serializability, which is pretty much the highest isolation guarantee you can get on the market today. So it says it guarantees serializability. What does that mean? It means that it guarantees equivalent, you know, it'll process parallel will process transactions concurrently, but that concurrent processing transactions will end up in a state that is equivalent to as if it had ran them in, in serial order. So, uh, so that's nice. That's very strong of isolation. It has all kinds of nice properties to it, which we'll learn about in Andy's database class. Uh, but um, it's uh, the thing, though, is that it doesn't it doesn't have any guarantee about any particular serial order. It just says it'll guarantee equivalent to some serial order. But it doesn't tell you which serial order. So, if I'm running transactions in parallel, two uh, two databases running the same set of transactions in parallel may end up equivalent to different serial orders. So, for example, let's, let's see an example here on this slide. Uh, so we have uh, uh, a same example we had before of, trend of customer customer two buying widget three, that gets sent to both replicas, and then we have also uh, a separate transaction where customer six is trying to buy widget three as well, and there's only one widget left. Notice there's only one left in stock, right? So they both can't succeed, and so we have two transactions running at the same time in parallel, uh, and so even if both copies, right? So the left, the left side of the screen is one replica and the right side is another replica. So even if both replicas see the exact same two input transactions and they even see them potentially given in the same order, still because they're concurrent with each other, a, uh, the serializable system will only guarantee equivalent to some serial order, but it doesn't say if it's T1 before T2 or T2 before T1. And so in practice, what can happen is that uh, on the first replica, say uh, the thread, which is running T1, T1 grabs the lock for widget three first, and therefore, uh, T1, you know, T2 will get blocked behind it, and T1 will be successful. And when T2 eventually gets to go, it'll fail at uh, W in stock less than one, then abort. And so basically, T1 will succeed and T2 will fail. Whereas the other replica, T2, the thread running T2 may grab the lock first um, uh, on, on widget three. Uh, and therefore, T2 will succeed, and T1 will have to get blocked behind it uh, until T2 releases the lock. And then T2 will, uh, T1 will will eventually fail at, at the W in stock less than one. So basically, what will happen then is that, uh, is that you'll end up with, with the replicas diverging, right? So because of the way the lock, the threads are scheduled across the different replicas, you end up with uh, different 
uh, different final states because of the fact they're running transactions in concurrently with each other, right? So if you don't, if, if you have, if you're running, if you're running a traditional system, uh, then you don't get determinism. It's not you. you, you um, there's all kinds of non-statistic events that happen in the system, such as third scheduling and so on. We'll see on the next slide. I think some other examples of uh, non-statistic events. Uh, that uh, um, that will cause potentially cause replicates to diverge if you don't enforce determinism through the system itself. Okay, so that's and that's bad, right? So in in a deterministic system, uh, the way it's going to work um, uh, is that we're going to uh, uh, we have to agree on the input still, right? So what's going to happen is we can, you know, if we do have if we have a bunch of transactions being submitted to the system concurrently with each other. And those transactions may be submitted from different parts of the world, right? So, you know, T1 may come from, you know, from Boston and T2 from, uh, from uh, Silicon Valley, T3 from, from, from London and so on, and they come from different parts of the world, but there has to be some sort of way for, uh, um, for all replicas to agree on the input, right? So in, in practice, the way it has done it in a deterministic system is that you have an input log, right? So, uh, uh, which is you know, typically implemented through Paxos or Raft or some kind of consensus protocol. Where all the replicas agree on what the input is, and in particular, they they um you know they, they agree that you know T1 is called T1 and T3 is called T3, um so they so give a sort of a name to all the transactions, which which kind of, kind of comes with a natural order of them, uh so that that way we can sort of um uh declare globally declare what is the input to the system, right? So that, so there is some. Uh, you know, before we get to, you know, before we get to, so I should say for now, this is this is a temporary fix, right? So, uh, so we'll see soon that uh, you know, this log is going to become a latency ball, and like we're not going to want it, so we have to get rid of it soon. But just so sort of at this point in the discussion uh, where we are now, let's assume we have it, just to make the rest, of, you know, the rest of the discussion a little bit easier, and then we'll, get, we'll figure out how to get rid of this log afterwards. But for now, we'll have we'll, we'll run Paxos across the whole world, so all transactions enter this Paxos log, uh, and all replicas see the same the same log. Uh, and once we do that, then uh, uh, all the different replicas will see the same log, and they will process transactions uh, with a guarantee even stronger than serializable isolation. Right. So serializable isolation, we said before, guarantees equivalent to some serial order. But uh, in a deterministic system, we'll guarantee, we'll guarantee equivalence to is it will guarantee serializable equivalence to only one possible order, which is the order that transactions appear in that Paxos log. Uh, so, um, so that's a, um, um, so that's a sort of a a, a a stronger isolation guarantee than uh, than the regular serializable uh, guarantee. But if we do that, then then um, that's going to go a long way to helping us uh, in, uh, be able to enforce the deterministic guarantees. I saw someone. Is someone about to speak? I don't. I don't think so. Okay, I saw a microphone go off, but I guess that was oh. uh, okay. Um, okay, all right. So um, I can we can still pause. Any questions so far before I move on? Um, I, I I know I'm speaking pretty fast, but that's my natural way of dealing with things. It actually seems slower this time. I'm be honest. Oh, that's good. Okay, good. Yeah, uh, that's yes, good. Uh, uh, I know it's good or bad. I know, but uh, it's uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway. So let's keep on going. Uh, and if there are no questions. Uh, so, uh, so let's keep on going. So, okay. So, uh, so let's move on to failure now, right? So basically, uh, just, to, just to summarize before we move on to failure. Um, so, uh, so in a traditional, in a traditional system, you don't, you, you don't get determinism for free, uh, because of non deterministic events, such as, such as, um, such as, uh, sketch, Threads being scheduled differently on different replicas, such as messages being, being delivered in different orders, such as uh, uh, nodes failing non-deterministically in different replicas. Right? So things can happen in different in different uh, different events can happen in different replicas, and so if you only guarantee sizeability, you end up with divergence, and so you end up having to have a strong isolation guarantee to to enforce determinism. So that's 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 one thing we'll, we'll, we'll keep that in mind. We'll come back to it soon. But the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, um, uh, is that you know, we saw before that one other problem that we deal with in traditional database systems um, is is the commit protocol and the fact that we're holding locks during the commit protocol, which and we need the commit protocol in order to ensure that um, uh, that nodes uh, that uh, you know that communicate with each other don't fail independently. That we we sort of guarantee the the, the um, durability and atomicity of of the system as a whole once we divide the system across different partitions, right? So let's come back to that now and, and discuss how we can deal with um, uh, how determinism also helps us uh, get rid of commit protocols, which is also very important. Okay, so let's 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 see how this works. 
before we do that, let's just let's remind ourselves how failure, what happens during a failure in, in a traditional system. So in a traditional, in a traditional system, we're running a transaction. Uh, and, and again, it's non deterministic so only running a one machine, one copy first. We'll do application after we do the transaction, after we run the transaction changes on one of the first, right? So transaction comes in, uh, customer two wants to buy widget three, gets run on one of the first, we acquire the locks, we make the changes. Uh, and now, oh no, a machine fails, right? So uh, so unlike what we saw before, where everything was, was working fine, now a machine fails in our system, right? So in a traditional system, what happens is that uh, we detect that failure during two-phase commit, right? During the commit protocol, we see the machine failed. And therefore, uh, we're going to make the whole transaction fail. We'll undo the changes that we made so far. If you see down here, this torpedo will go back to 100. We'll undo the, the, the changes because of the fact the machine failed, right? So a machine failure causes a transaction failure in a traditional system. Um, and, and the commit protocol is designed to detect those, those, those uh, machine failures to ensure that we, we end up with all machines agreeing that this, that this, that this transaction should not succeed. That's how it works in, in a traditional system. However, in a deterministic system, everything has to be different, right? Because a machine, a, a machine failing is a fundamentally, well, it's usually at least, I shouldn't say fundamentally, it is usually a non-deterministic event, right? So, so therefore, if a machine fails, uh, then it may fail in one replica, but not in another replica. So if we're going to enforce that the, the replicas cannot communicate with each other during transaction processing, uh, then there is no way for a replica in London to be aware of the fact that one of the machines in Boston failed, right? So a machine failure in Boston absolutely cannot cause transaction failure because there's no way for London to find out uh, that the machine in, in, in Boston failed. We don't want it to have to find out. That, that would take way too much time. So therefore, what happens in a deterministic system um, is that, again, we said before that, this, that the input is replicated, right? So the same the same transaction goes to all replicas. They're all running the same transaction at the same time. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, right, so, so everyone's running the same transaction at the same time. And now, our, and now we'll, you know, they're, they're doing it independently from each other. They're just, they're just independently running the same transaction. And now, a and now a replica fails, right? Oh, sorry, and now one of the machines of one of the replicas fails, right? So, but the same machine, and the other replica may not fail. In fact, it probably doesn't fail, right? So it depends on, you know, I would say even usually it does not fail. Usually uh, a failure is, is an independent event that occurs only in one replica. So in that situation, what we said is that we cannot allow the failure of a machine in one replica to cause the whole transaction to fail. So instead, what has to happen uh, is that uh, this transaction does not, that this failure of the machine does not cause the transaction to abort. Instead, what needs to happen is that this, if the transaction could have committed, if it wasn't for the failure, it must eventually commit, right? So therefore, the, this copy over here on the right hand side of the screen in London say, we'll commit the transaction immediately. And the copy of our database on the left side of the screen, which is in say Boston, uh, that copy uh, will have to pause, right? It, it, it can't sort of continue yet because of the fact that a machine has failed, uh, but, uh, but it can't avoid a transaction either. So what will have to happen um, is that, uh, that this machine that failed will not cause the transaction to fail, but rather once this machine recovers, uh, it'll, re it'll recover its state where it was uh, at the time of the crash by replaying the input log. And remember, the input log is deterministic, right? So it, it's able to get back to where it was at the time of the crash by replaying the input log. Uh, and then play forward from there rather than playing backward, right? So whereas before, uh, we play, we'd, undo, we'd undo changes that we made as a result of the machine failing. Now, instead, we play forward. We, 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 get, back, we, we get back to where we were at the time of the crash. And then we play forward from there as if the crash never happened, right? So a transaction failure does not cause a, uh, a, 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 sorry, a, a machine failure does not cause a transaction fail in a deterministic system. And that's huge. If you, if you do that, if you're able to do that, then you don't need, you don't need to phase commit anymore. Uh, so then we'll see, let's see why, right? So um, hold on a second. Uh, where are we right now? Um, right. So yeah, okay. Sorry. sorry. Um, so um, we're still, uh, so before I get to how, how you don't need to phase commit. I'm, I got a little ahead of myself, actually. <laughs> uh, so before we get to how you don't need to phase commit in uh, in the dismiss system, let, let's see how to phase commit works in the, in a in a um, in a traditional system. Which in, in the traditional system, uh, uh, the transaction comes in, we acquire the locks, like I said before, we change the changes, 
we have we run you know two phase commit to make sure that no machine fail. Like if a machine fails, then we have to put up a trans transaction. So we run two phase commit to ensure that no machine failed. And only once uh, we figure out that no machine failed, can the transaction commit. Whereas in a deterministic system, uh, what happens uh, uh, is that a transaction failure does not a machine failure does not cause transaction failure. So therefore, what what this is the way the commit protocol works in the deterministic system is much much more more simple. The way it works is that uh, each machine, we said before, each replica runs independently from each other. So the, the replicas go ahead and make the changes they need to make. And now with a single message, we just have one the machine telling the other machine in this example uh, that it's not going to abort. Right? The, the, it, this machine didn't reach any code in the transaction itself that would that would force the transaction to abort. Right. So uh, so this machine down here on the bottom left of the screen. Um, you know, there is code that could cause it to abort, in particular, if it, when it runs, if in stock less than one, then abort, uh, you know, so that code, um, you know, that, that, that's, that's deterministic code which would cause an abort, right? So if the stock was zero at this point in time, there is no way for this transaction to exceed because it's, it's a deterministic abort, right? So, uh, so there has to be some communication that this machine is not going to abort, but that communication happens with a single message, it's just to say, I, you know, once it gets past this line of code, right, it doesn't, it doesn't have to wait on the transaction, right? Just once it gets past the second line of code in the transaction and it figures out that it's not going to abort, it can send a message to the other machine that's not going to abort. There's no way from here on out that it can possibly abort. And then at that point, the other machine, the first machine, uh, the top, the top machine in the slide over here can then immediately commit, uh, uh, once it figures out it's not going to abort either, can immediately commit the transaction without any kind of commit protocol, right? So basically, rather than having these two rounds of communication across machines, instead, we just need sort of a half of a round of communication to, to, for each machine to tell every other machine, or at least to tell some leader machine uh, that there is no deterministic code uh, that will force it to abort. Um, and once it gets past that, you know, once it can be ensure that it will not abort deterministically, at that point, we can immediately abort the transaction, immediately commit the transaction without uh, any further communication. So rather than two rounds of communication, it's a half round of communication, it's, it's much faster. And in some cases, it's zero rounds of communication, right? So if the transaction didn't have a possibility of deterministic abort, so for example, if the transaction was give everybody a 25% raise in salary, but there is no way that, uh, that that transaction can abort. So in fact, that transaction where there is no logic in the transaction which would cause an abort can commit immediately as soon as it hits the log, the input log, it can commit immediately. There is no way for, for, um, for any machine to, uh, to, to, to be able to, uh, to, 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 any machine to fail to process that transaction. So, um, uh, so in some cases, commit protocol requires zero rounds of communication. In some cases, it requires a half round of communication. But it's much, still much, much cheaper than the full two rounds of communication in two-phase commit. And that's good. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, this this sort of summarizes what we just said, right? So, uh, so if there is a data dependent abort possible, then there's no commit protocol whatsoever. And if it is possible, it's a half round of communication, uh, uh, which is much better than than two phase commit, like we said. Okay. So, um, so the key question now is how do we do this, right? So how do we ensure, right? So we said before, if we have determinism, the life is great. Replication is really easy, and two phase commit goes away. But the question is. How do we enforce determinism? How do we how do we make sure that uh, that each machine? We said, we, said, we said before that one key part of it, part, part of enforcing determinism, is ensuring that each machine processes transactions equivalently to the order they appear in the log. But how do we even do that? How do we run transactions concurrently uh, in a way that um, uh, that still ensures that the final result will be equivalent to as if we run every transaction, as if we ran every transaction in the same order they appeared in the log serially? And that's a question. How do we do that? So let's let's discuss that now. So it turns out uh, this is actually pretty easy. Um, and we have written in my group about five or six different papers that uh, discuss five or, different, five or six different ways to do this, right? So there's a way to do this via locking, a way to do this via uh, uh, optimism, a way to do this via multi-versioning. Um, there's all kinds of different ways to do this. Uh, so, um, so I'll just tell you the, the simplest one. Um, which is which is using locking, and it, it, you know, the, the, the simplest one is is not is is not the most optimal one as far as speed goes, uh, but it works um, uh, and uh, and it's pretty straightforward to understand. So I think we'll, let's discuss that one. Let's discuss that one now. So uh, so every transaction immediately requests. So the, the way this works is that uh, um, what we're going to do is that as transaction as each replica reads the input log, each replica 
will uh, will if, if we'll use locking. So each replica will request the locks for all data they need to access in the order that transactions appear in the log. So in other words, if transaction one appears before transaction two in the input log, that means that transaction one will make all of its lock requests before transaction two makes its first lock request. So we have to request locks in the order they appear in the log, and we have to grant locks in the order they were requested. If you do that, then that's basically all we need to do. Basically, if you, you know that you know it's it's it's, it's fairly straightforward to prove that that not only if you, if you request locks in the order will are we guaranteed to be equivalent to as if you ran with transactions in the order they appear in the log, but but furthermore, we can even prove that this is a deadlock free that protocol as well because of the fact there's no way to get cycles because we're requesting locks in the order they appear. You know, all tra all transaction ones locks are requested before transactions two locks even get started. So you're both deadlock free. And you're also equivalent to the order that, that, that the transactions appeared in the input log, and that's great. So, uh, so that's good. The only problem, the only the issue on into though, is that uh, what if you don't know what if it, what if the system doesn't know what locks will be required before the transaction begins, right? So if um, uh, if you know so, so you know as transaction at the end of the system, we can't request the first lock of transaction two until the last lock of transaction one has been requested. So therefore, we can't process transaction two until the last lock of transaction one is requested. So if we don't, if we don't know what transaction one needs to lock, then we can't even start running transaction two until transaction one is is done figuring out what it needs to lock, and that's going to end up being, being sort of very slow because we'll end up not being able to run transaction two concurrently with transaction one. So if you want to have concurrent concurrent execution of transactions, uh, we can't really sort of wait to to request the first lock of transaction two until trans transaction one finally figures out what it needs to lock. Right. So in practice, what we do in this version of, of, of implementing ter determinism uh, is that um, is that we don't actually start uh, we don't actually sort of submit a transaction blindly to the system. So instead, if a transaction is submitted to the system, which uh, has logic in it for which you, uh, the system is not able to look at the transaction and figure out immediately what it's going to need to access, what it's going to read or what it's going to write. Then it, what it does is it first runs a trial run that transaction. It sort of it makes a guess. It, it sort of does a sort of a, um, a very simple uh, sort of we call it reconnaissance phase, a uh, very simple uh, uh, process where it sort of run it, it it runs enough of the transaction to figure out to to to, to generate a guess of what it's going to access. And then once it creates that guess, only then does it go into the input log uh, that every that every replica sees. Uh, and then they all sort of once they see the guess, they'll they'll, they'll, they'll request the locks uh, uh, that it, it that it guess it'll need. And if it turns out that they made the wrong guess because the data changed between the time when it, it made the guess and, and now when it runs uh, in, in the official uh, uh, in the official deterministic execution, uh, then every single replica will see that the guess was wrong and all sort of independently decide to abort and, re and restart the transaction. Dan, I, I think it's probably worth mentioning that DynamoDB is the way they do transactions is very similar to something like this. Uh, let me um, see if I can um, uh, agree with you or disagree with you. Uh, we we had we had a, speak, a speaker I know we could our group last last year, so okay, just didn't come across. Uh, so so go ahead. So go ahead. Uh, I mean, my understanding was like you you say I do all my reads and writes and I store them in 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 the in the variables on the code and then I call the transaction and then it basically checks that, that like you get the same thing when you when you read the same thing again. When you, but what's the, um, I mean, so DynamoDB is not a transactional database system, right? At all. So, no, it is. Hold up. Where have you been? Yeah. They have transactions now. Oh, they do. Okay. I, I guess yeah. uh, maybe I'm a little out of date then. Um, oh, okay. So, I'll, I will send you the video after this. Okay. Fine. Yeah. I guess you had a more recent. Oh, version. they published an OSDI. That's why might, you probably didn't see it. Okay. Um, when? Last year. Last year. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. I don't, I don't think I saw it. Yeah. All right. Like, I'll, so, uh, keep going. This year, I've been basically whatever you know. Oh, you you, you have a zero you have a zero month year old baby or what? How, how <laughs> so yeah, I'm not I'm not on on this year's this, this, year, this year's papers. Anyway, so um, so uh, I, I'm uh, only I'm only I'm only bringing it up to say that like this idea of reconnaissance transaction is not far fetched. Like it's, it's people are doing this. Yeah, not only okay. that. But this is Panos Kazantis, or University of Pittsburgh. Actually, oh, one of these protocols was also proposed. It's called speculative transactions. And uh, basically, you run the transaction, and possibly you run also while you are acquiring the logs, one optimistically or whether in a pessimistic fashion. And whichever finishes first succeeds. There is a variation of that uh, that was proposed in the 
Um, yeah, in, the, in the hardware community, this, this is very this, this is very frequently done, right? Of course, and yeah, and, and yeah, and in the, I mean, this is not supposed to be not claiming this is a new idea. Um, we're just using. First of all, that DynamoDB is way after you know way after you know <laughs> we published uh, you know our OLP protocol way way before that DynamoDB. So, but even then, when we even then when we published it, we didn't claim that this part was new, right? So we're, we're just sort of you using know, the it's idea. It's a good idea. No, no, we don't we don't know the comment that we make is not to dispute the yeah. uh, novelty or whatever. It's a cool idea. Is the sense that you know it was proposed now it surface and it's implemented in a cool way. But uh, you know, as general uh, uh, point is uh, how you compare and contrast them to see what you are learning in each and every time that these ideas is implemented. Right. I mean, just the, the point I'm making though is that like is that the solution isn't speculation. The problem, the problem, speculation is coming to solve a different problem, right? So we introduce a new problem by by having determinism. You know, life was great, but we ran into a new problem as a result of this particular locking protocol, which resulted in sort of uh, a reduction in currency because of the fact that transactions had to wait to figure out what things to be locking. And so, so then speculation just comes along to sort of um, solve sort of a side problem that we introduced as a result of a deterrency protocol. Right? But the, no, the court- uh, Absolutely, because again, this problem was also uh, faced in the multi device systems that uh, you were executing in autonomous so, sites, but you wanted to execute this transaction in a deterministic fashion. So they use the notion of a, a ticket, where basically, which is similar to this, uh, instead of trying to uh, or, or speculate, get all your logs and try to come up, then every transaction goes and visits the site, gets a ticket, and if there are tickets, now the tickets are compared and force everybody a serial execution, based on these tickets, these acquired tickets. So that serializes basically across all sites in a uh, specific serial order. So there are different ways. And again, it still has deadlocks as uh, although you say here there's deadlock free, still you have the rollback in the event that something goes wrong with the speculation. So it's hidden deadlock or recovery, uh, but it's cool. Uh, what I'm saying is not uh, negates what you're saying. Okay, thank you. Okay, right, sounds good. Okay, so that's um. Uh, okay, I see Andy put a comment here also on on the Dynamo talk. It, Great. It, okay, it was fast twenty nineteen. It's probably even more reason why you didn't see it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so let's, let's move on. Let's move on. Okay, sounds good. So thank you. Um. Uh, um. Uh, for all that. That's good. Okay, so um, let's keep on going. So uh, additional right. So um. So just yeah. Oh, we're kind of like short on time here. Um. Let me just breeze through this slide very quickly, just, just sort of get a very high level. I just wanted to quickly mention that uh, you really, really mentioned a bunch of advantages of determinism already. We talked about like, you know, moving to base commit and removing um, sort of, uh, sort of moving holding lock string application and, and moving deadlocks. You should also mention also makes sort of design of the database much simpler as well. Um, so, you know, sort of makes it much more modular because of the fact that sort of the logging, the recovery module is totally separate from the system. Uh, the locking is, is also pretty much, it's basically done separately as well. Um, so sort of, uh, you end up with a much more modular system with the, if you determinism than, than, than other systems. But I think, you know, that discussion is a much deeper discussion that we can't really, um, we can't really um, spend much more time on now. Um, so, I just want to give you a general sense of performance uh, before we get to solving a, a separate problem in the last 10 minutes, um, which is uh, just, just want to give you a quick sense of, of the throughput of, of, of just the locking protocol we mentioned already, right? So, so we'll see we'll see soon some, some other problems, we'll to solve those problems, right? But just of, of, of the protocol we mentioned we've discussed so far, um, uh, you know, the base, the basic the basic uh, goal they're trying to do is trying to reduce the period of time holding locks, right? So we said that we hold locks during two-base commit, you hold locks during cyclic replication, that reduces the ability to market current transactions and that's bad. And so you sort of you sort of see in a traditional system, as you increase throughput in the system, uh, the as, as you sorry, as you increase contention in the system, throughput drops because of the fact that we're holding locks and we're doing all these things, we're holding locks and that's bad. Whereas in the deterministic system, uh, because we, we significantly reduce the period of time that we hold locks, as you increase contention, you actually get the reverse, you actually get better performance rather than worse performance because of the fact that we don't, we don't hold locks for so long and, and we have more contention, we have more cash locality, as you end up actually, in many cases, actually be, so seeing contention improve with, with seeing performance improve the contention while they're going down. But anyway, but that's, you know, the, the uh, so we haven't really gotten to the main point yet, um, <laughs> well, one of the main points yet, which is uh, uh, the, main, the main contributions of SLOG, uh, which is that we said before, 
that uh, uh, that we have this sort of uh, you know this input log. Right? We said that in 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 uh, in our deterministic system, all transactions to go through some sort of Pactos or RAF log uh, at the input of the system, and uh, um, so that all replicas can agree on the input, right? And so even though that uh, we got rid of the commit protocol, the latency and, th and the throughput reduction for the commit protocol, and even though we got rid of um, the, the throughput reduction of replication by repl replicating outside of transactional boundaries, we still have to pay the cost of the consistency of this consensus protocol uh, if, uh, uh, for every right transaction. Right, so when tra tra transactions come into the system, every single one of them has to go, has to go through this raft or, or practice protocol. And so if our replicas distribute across the world, if, we, if we're dealing with a truly global ap application, we have a replica in Boston, a replica in Europe, a replica in Asia, and they're all, um, you know, and, and we communicate across the whole world for every single write to, to insert it into the practice log, you know, that's, uh, that's a pretty big latency and that's really unacceptable um, in practice uh, for, for many applications. Even though reads can be done fast, uh, you know, writes, you know, uh, are, are, are slow and that's, and that's not, not okay. So, uh, so we have to get rid of this log, this input log as well. And it turns out you can. Uh, so, um, um, so it gets a little more complicated, and that's the most recent slog paper from from last year, which sort of goes into a lot of detail on that on that particular protocol. Uh, but uh, uh, the basic idea is that uh, is that we had to we have to replace synchronous application with uh, with a mixture of synchronous and asynchronous application. So what we'll do is we'll do synchronous application locally and to sort of nearby uh, regions, and we'll do asynchronous application across regions. But we're still going to guarantee uh, full strict sizability and you know the highest levels of consistency possible. And the way you do that is that uh, you for every single data item in the database system. Uh, you you declare for it a primary location, right? So it has some primary location somewhere, and typically it's going to be where it's accessed most frequently, right? So uh, a user's data who lives in Boston will probably have uh, his primary uh, location for his data in Boston, or as a user in, in, in China will have uh, their primary uh, their data be have primary location in China, and so on, right? So every data item will have a primary location. Uh, and uh, linearizable reads and writes to those data items has to be processed by the primary location, right? So if I'm a user in Boston, I want to read my data in Boston, uh, that's, that's going to require a simple read or write to a local replica in Boston. But if I want to read uh, data in, uh, that has a primary location in China, I can't read the copy in, in Boston, even though there is a copy in Boston. Uh, I can't read it because that data may not be uh, consistent with uh, with the data in China, which is which is constantly being updated, right? So, if I want to get a consistent linearizable read of that data item. I have to uh, send that read or write to uh, uh, to China. Uh, so, uh, um, so, uh, so yeah. So that's that's the basic. So that's that you know that's sort of uh, you know sort of the basic background that, that we're going to assume. So we're going to assume the data is primary locations. We're going to assume that uh, the data is accessed most frequently uh, near the primary location. Uh, and then what we'll do is we're going to get rid of our global, that global practice log, and instead we're going to replace them with local logs uh, near every region. And so the goal is going to be then is going to be to sort of guarantee the same levels of isolation and, and consistency when you have transactions that may access data that have multiple different primary locations. You know, a, a transaction comes along where, you know, I want to transfer money to, to user in China. So both, you know, so my primary location is Boston, the China's Prime location is China, so that's going to be some, uh, you know, that there, there's, there's, you know, both locations have to be involved in the transaction. So how do I uh, get both locations involved in the transaction while still guaranteeing all the the, normal, the guarantees of high isolation, high consistency that, that we have before? That's going to be the challenge. So uh, at a high level, we only, we only have five minutes left. Uh, so let's just kind of, kind of go through this at a high level. Um, so uh, so to single home, so single region transactions are pretty straightforward to run, right? So if transaction one comes along. And accesses data items A and C, and so A and C have a primary location in region one, and B and E a primary location in region two, and D a primary, loca primary location in region three. So A and C go to region one. Uh, uh, D go uh, since since uh, you know it's a single uh, only this transaction two only touches uh, data item D, which is primary in region three, so it goes there. Uh, T three, which accesses B and C, um, uh, now we have a problem, right? Now B and C. Uh, uh, have you know B has a primary location in region two and C has a primary location in region one. So at a high level, what we're going to do is we're going to sort of split the transaction into pieces, right? So part of T three will be done in T, T region two, and part of of, of T three will be done in region one. 
So it will get split up into pieces, and I'm going to have to reconstruct the transaction after the fact to ensure that uh, we still have sort of a, um, a global sizability, even though the transaction will be done in pieces at different regions. So T4 goes to region two, say T5 is also multi-region, so it'll go to both, it'll get split up and go to both regions, uh, and so on and so on. And then, and then so basically each region uh, will will uh, receive the input log cons consisting of transactions which are relevant to that particular region. And so they'll create you know, that same pack, that same global Paxos log we had before uh, that we saw in the previous slides. Now we'll have a local version of that of that log per region. Uh, and then so these input transactions will, will go into each local regions, uh, each each local uh, log for each region, and then we'll replicate each uh, each region's log to the other regions asynchronously, right? So region one's input log of, a, of T1, T3, and T5 uh, will get replicated asynchronously to region two and region three, and uh, region uh, two's uh, log will go to the other two regions, and region three's log will go to the other two regions. So eventually, asynchronously, all the regions will see the, the logs of all the other regions, but uh, 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 but that happens sort of after the fact. So uh, so the only sort of up to date versions of, of of A and C are only found in region one, and the only up to date versions of B and E are in region two, and, and so on. So then um, so then the way the protocol is going to work. Okay, we only have three minutes left. The way but you know at a high level, the way the protocol is going to work is that uh, um, single home transactions. Uh, are going to be a single region, you know, home or region, I use them uh, synonymously. Uh, so single home transactions commit as soon as they com as they complete at their primary region, right? So if T1, uh, which is single home, it only access data in, in A and C, it can commit immediately as soon as it is processed to region one. However, multi-region transactions such as T3 and T5, which access data in multiple regions, uh, they have to wait for the asynchronous replication of the input log before they can they can commit the transaction, right? So they have to wait for the log to arrive, and then uh, they're going to process the transaction once they have all the relevant log records at each at, at each local region. So they'll they'll take a little, little, little bit longer, but the assumption is is that it's better to have most transactions be fast at the cost of having um, the uh, multi-region transactions to be a little bit slower. So that's that's the basic idea here. And so, um, uh, just skipping, you know, uh, to, to some experiments. I, I, um, um, let's uh, let's let's skip that that, that one. Go straight to, to um, uh, well, I don't know. I guess they're both interesting. Um, so you know, so roughly speaking, just very quickly. Um, uh, uh, if you look at if you look at latency, um, so traditional systems uh, uh, that that have a global Paxos log like Calvin or like Spanner or like the system we described, described earlier in the earlier slide, we had a global log. Those systems, you know, they were, you know you, you had to run consensus in every single transaction. So every single transaction takes the cost of running that consensus protocol. So the protocol is running globally, say across say 200 milliseconds of of of, of re radius of, of of time across the world. That every transaction has to take every right transaction has to take at least 200 milliseconds. So that's very slow. Whereas in slog, you know, most transactions are, are you know, orders of magnitude faster if they're local, and only the the multi-region ones are a little bit are, are slower or at the same order of magnitude as uh, as as all the tra transactions in, in say Calvin or Spanner. And if you look at throughput, uh, then uh, uh, um, sort of you have sort of uh, another interesting point here, which is that uh, you know here we're comparing throughput uh, of, of slog with Spanner. So Spanner is a system sort of works like a traditional database system in the sense that uh, um, that they sort of hold locks uh, during communication across across regions. Uh, so Spanner actually they don't actually allow you to run, to have a sp setup of, of of regions that span more than a, a radius of, of a thousand miles. That the right replicas in, in, the, in the Paxos protocol and spanner has to be within hundred miles of each other. So we, so as a result, um, you, know, uh, you know, because it's a traditional system, as you add more contention to the workload, the, the performance of spanner drops off a cliff, right? So, you know, if, if you, you know, if, 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 if normalized throughput is, is one, say when, when throughput is low, is when contention, when contention is low, as you increase contention, uh, because it's holding locks during, uh, during replication and during uh, 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 coordination of the two-phase commit, um, then, uh, then the, the throughput of spanner drops off a cliff. Whereas in slog, because it doesn't hold locks during uh, during application, it doesn't hold locks during uh, during uh, commit protocol. Therefore, it, it it still does go down a little bit here. The throughput does decline a little bit as you increase contention uh, across the whole world. But uh, uh, but it's still 
de degrades much more gracefully than Spanner. And, and keep in mind that, that Slog is a really a truly global deployment across Asia, uh, uh, sorry, uh, this is actually across East Coast, West Coast, and Europe, whereas Spanner is only within a thousand miles of each other. It's a much, much more narrow radius. Anyway, so we're out of time. Uh, I don't want to um, I don't want to get uh, booted off uh, Zoom by Andy. No. Um, so we'll stop here. Show a conclusion slide. Come on. Uh, sorry? Show a conclusion slide. Do I have one? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> OK. All right, there you go. Awesome. Dan, thank you. I will clap on half everyone else. All right, we have time for one or two questions. So if you have a question, please unmute yourself and ask for it. Panos. Panos. I don't have any question. Okay. I just uh, it's clap happening. as well. Yeah. OK. Any, anybody else? All right, so, okay, Dan, so let me point some. Uh, there, Dennis Sasha, at some point, I was trying to find his paper that actually he tried to, uh, as part of uh, uh, privacy preserving uh, work, he attempted to do the same with uh, using different versions and uh, executing everything locally and then merging them, the logs. And if the logs were merged in the proper order, then uh, determinism was preserved. I don't know if you're aware of that work. Oh yeah, yes, we we cited that work yeah, in our first in our first I think two papers, the Calvin paper and the one before that, that motivated determinism. We cited that work, um, and uh, uh, yeah, I mean, so that, you know that was the early attempt at it. Uh, you know, it wasn't anywhere near the same performance that we can achieve in, in Calvin and Slog, um, but uh, but yeah, that was certainly an early attempt at determinism. I, I think that one actually didn't even get rid of two-phase commit though, right? I think that one, or did it actually no, wasn't, didn't use two-phase commit, right? So like they were, they were, I think it was, it was, a, it was, it was a replicated system that wasn't. I, I, it's been a while. So I looked, looked at it, but I think it was what it was. It was one node system was replicated to, to other to other other node to, to to another. It was like it was a, it wasn't a partition system. It was just a replicated system, if I remember correctly. Is that right? That's correct. It was yeah. uh, so. It was not partition. Then they never noted that you know. So so you know. So one key contribution of Calvin relative to that work is that um, that we that we show that determinism can even get rid of two phase commit in a in a in a partition system as well, which is, which is a very important contribution. Cool. Okay. Awesome, Dan. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I'm guessing you're in the basement because we hear the chairs from your kids upstairs. Wow, you can hear that? Wow, yeah. Yes.